Hello and welcome back to Biology in Focus. Today we're going to go over Chapter 38, Nervous and Sensory Systems. Um, my name is Mr. Sparks and I'll be taking you through this lecture for John Tyler Community College. Overview, sense and sensibility. Uh, gathering, processing, and organizing information are all are essential functions of all nervous systems. So in this chapter, we're going to be um, looking at uh, gathering, processing, and organizing information and uh, uh, using uh, various aspects of the nervous system. We'll begin to uh, examine the basic organization of nervous systems. And then we'll consider specialized regions in the vertebrate brain and how brain activity makes information and storage and organization possible. And then finally, we'll look at some uh, sensory processes that convey information about the animal's in internal and external environments. <clears throat> Here is the uh, star nose mole, Condylora cristata. Um, it's... Uh, native to North America and it lives in almost total darkness under the ground and it uh, it eats a, a it eats voraciously it eats uh, it, it has to eat constantly so it's always on the lookout for um, worms and insects that uh, are, are in the, its underground tunnels uh, to that end it has a sensory apparatus that are these appendages on its nose uh, that's its nose sticking up there. It's basically blind. Behind that are the eyes. But um, the, the nose sticking out here has these appendages that are um, tactile sensors. So when, the, when the, it comes into contact with a bug or an um, earthworm, it just uh, jumps forward and eats that up right away. In addition to these little appendages here, you can see that it's got some whiskers. And these whiskers help to uh, guide it through its tunnel and, and help it to uh, attack its prey. Nervous systems consist of circuits of neurons and supporting cells. Uh, the ability to sense and react originated billions of years ago in prokaryotes. Cr prokaryotes have... Uh, chemotaxis, they're able to use their um, flagella or their uh, cilia to move um, it, it, in the direction of or away from certain chemical stimulus. Hydras, jellies, and snedarians are the simplest uh, invertebrates with nervous systems. In most snedarians, interconnected nerve cells form a nerve net which controls contraction and expansion of the gastrovascular cavity. Uh, here's the hydra in, uh, up in the upper left hand corner with the uh, purple um, structure, that's the nerve net uh, surrounding the gastrovascular cavity and extending to the tentacles. Um, <clears throat> a hydra's nervous system contains individual neurons which are here represented in purple and they are organized in a diffuse nerve net. And then in, in the rest of these organisms here, more complicated nervous systems have a group of neurons in, shown in blue, organized into nerves and often ganglia and a, and a brain. <clears throat> so here you're getting the more organized structures uh, as you get more highly evolved organisms um, from planaria to insects, they're, they're kind of getting a brain here. And then by the time you get to uh, amphibians and tetrapods and, and vertebrates, you're getting a, a definite brain and then a spinal cord with uh, sensory ganglia down the, down the spine. In more complex animals, the axons of multiple nerve cells are often bundled together to form nerves. These vibrous structures channel and organize information flow through the nervous system. <clears throat> Animals with elongated bilaterally symmetrical bodies have even more specialized systems. Cephalization is the evolutionary trend toward a clustering of sensory neurons and interneurons at the anterior. 
Non-segmented worms have the simplest, clearly defined central nervous system, consisting of a small brain and longitudinal nerve cords. Annelids and arthropods have segmentally arranged clusters of neurons called ganglia. In vertebrates, the central nervous system is composed of the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is composed of the nerves and ganglia. So the peripheral nervous system is uh, everything outside of the central nervous system. And that's the, the uh, nerves that are basically involved in sensory adaptation, uh, uh, the sensory ad apparatus and the uh, apparatus for controlling the internal organs. Glia are, uh, are cells that uh, perform various functions primarily to nourish and support and regulate neurons. Embryonic radial glia form tracks along which new neurons migrate. So in the embryo during the developmental phase, uh, glia uh, basically form the, the, the tracks or the backbone, to use a term, um, along which the newly formed neurons will, will uh, fill in and migrate to. Astrocytes are star-shaped glial cells, and they include cells lining the capillaries in the central nervous system to form tight junctions resulting in the blood-brain barrier. Okay, here are some of these uh, astrocytes in green down at the bottom and uh, in, uh, in brown up on the top illustration. Um, here we have uh, epidemic epidymal cells. These uh, line the ventricles uh, uh, primarily around the brain and they have uh, cilia that promote the circulation of uh, cerebrospinal fluid. So this is like around the uh, primitive brain, um, around the connection between the, the uh, spine and the brain. <clears throat> And then we have uh, oligodendrocytes. These are another type of uh, uh, glial cells. Oligodendrocytes, um, myelinate axons with the, with the central nervous system. Myelination greatly increases the conduction and speed of uh, action potentials. Myelin is a, is a, a very important um, protein in the structure of these uh, um, nerve cells when myelin gets damaged uh, as it does in um, in um, oh what is the name of that disease um, multiple sclerosis multiple sclerosis damages these uh, myelin sheath that sur surround the uh, the uh, axons then that can damage the function of the neurons Schwann cells uh, also myelinate uh, the axons. These are uh, supportive cells, like similar to glial cells. Um, they myelate axons in the peripheral nervous system. So when these axons extend for long periods of time, uh, or long periods of distances, um, the Schwann cells help protect those nerve cells. And microglia are immune cells that uh, protect against pa pa pathogens. So here is the microglia here. They're, they're kind of like, uh, they serve uh, a, a similar function to uh, white blood cells. Now down here below, uh, um, here's the uh, astrocytes here in brown and the astrocytes in green here. Astrocytes facilitate the information transfer at synopses and in some instances they release neurotransmitters. Astrocytes ne uh, next to active neurons cause nearby blood vessels to dilate, increasing blood flow and enabling the neurons to uh, obtain oxygen and glucose more quickly. Astrocytes are, are regular, regulate extracellular concentrations of ions and neurotransmitters. So these astrocytes are like your archetypal glial cells. They're really there to help support the, um, the, uh, the neurons. Here are the neurons in blue. The green cells of this mammalian brain tissue are astrocytes labeled with a fluorescent antibody. 
and a blue dye that binds D DNA in the nuclei of the all cells reveals the intermingling of astrocytes and other cells, predominantly neurons. So here's the glial cells, the astrocytes in green, and the um, <coughs> neurons here in blue. So you can see they're all mixed up together, and the function of the glial cells, the astrocytes, is to support the um, the uh, the uh, neurons. And there's different uh, types of glial cells: microglial cells, Schwann cells, oligodendrocytes, and then here's the neuron, all surrounded in this glial mass. Okay, the organization of the vertebrate nervous system. The spinal cord runs lengthwise inside the vertebral column, or also known as the spine. The spinal cord conveys information to and from the brain. It can also act as a, independently of the brain as part of the simple nervous circuits that produce reflexes, the body's automatic response to certain stimuli. So here's the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, and here's the peripheral nervous system, uh, cranial nerves, ganglia outside the central nervous system, spinal nerves, okay, all these major nerves, femoral nerves, brachial nerves down the arm, okay, all these major nerves here are um, uh, primarily these axons here and then you get uh, up and towards here you get the uh, neurons um, where they connect to the spinal cord and when you have a reflexive action like when the doctor uh, thumps you on the elbow with the, or on the knee with a um, little hammer he's trying to test your reflexes that uh, response goes that goes uh, that input goes directly to your spinal cord and then your and then it and then the uh, response is directly from your spinal cord to your knee back again. So a reflex does not go up to the brain because the brain, you know, has to interpret that information and then you you're, then you're going to act on that information. Whereas a reflex is a direct response from the spinal cord. The central nervous system consists of the brain and the spinal cord in yellow and left and right pairs of cranial nerves, spinal nerves and ganglia make up most of the peripheral nervous system uh, shown here in dark gold. The brain and the spinal cord contain gray matter which consists of mainly of neuronal cell bodies and glia and white matter which consists of bundles of myelinated axons. The central nervous system contains fluid filled spaces called ventricles in the brain and the central canal in, in the spinal cord. The cerebrospinal fluid is formed in the brain and circulates through the ventricles and the central canal and drains into the veins. It supplies the central nervous system with nutrients and hormones and carries away waste. The peripheral nervous system transmits information to and from the central nervous system and regulates movement and the internal environment. In the peripheral nervous system, uh, afferent nu neurons transmit information to the central nervous system and efferent nervous systems trans neurons transmit information away from nervous systems. So afferent means it's going towards the brain, towards the central ner nervous system, and efferent means it's being carried, the information is being carried away from the brain to the, to the peripheral nervous system. Okay, here's the schematic of the uh, functionality hier hierarchy of vertebrate peripheral nervous systems. Okay, uh, let's start over here in the lower left-hand corner. We have an external stimuli. Um, uh, somebody's uh, tapping you on the shoulder trying to get your attention that's uh, uh, taken up by your sensory uh, receptors and then it goes from your at myelinated afferent neurons um, into the central nervous system and then your, cent your central nervous system is going to pr prompt you for a response you're going to 
turn your head and see who's tapping you on your shoulder. That goes through the efferent neurons away from the central nervous system and and um, into the uh, in, in the case that we're the, the example that we're having somebody's tapping on your shoulder it goes to the motor system and that uh, it moderates the control of your skeletal system and they're going to turn your head one way or other to see where it goes now um, that other that stimuli could be an internal stimuli in which case um, it, it may be moderating uh, some part of your internal organs um, and then it goes through your autonomic nervous system. Um, this is the nervous system that controls most of your internal organs, your sympathetic division, parasympathetic division, and the enteric division. The enteric division uh, mostly controls um, your guts and whatnot, and your, uh, the sympathetic division is responsible for the fight or flight uh, response. So this is what's going to prompt your... Uh, release uh, maybe that person that tapped on your shoulder was a big scary person and you want to get away as quickly as possible so um, that response will be uh, cause a state of hyper arousal uh, in which we are prepared to respond to a threat and uh, your heart will beat faster your digestion is going to slow down and the adrenal medulla secretes epinephrine basically adrenaline um, and that's going to prepare you to to fly to to uh, depart that location immediately. The activation of the parasympathetic division generally causes the opposite reaction and is promotes a calming or retor or, or self maintenance um, function. So, like after we've gotten away from that scary situation, then the parasympathetic division will begin to kick into pl into place. And then uh, it, it will allow our bodies to go back into our more normal functions of digestion and, and uh, self-maintenance. Okay, and the enteric division is, the, is responsible for the digestive tract, the pancreas, and the gallbladder. The peripheral nervous system has two efferent components, the motor system and the autonomic nervous system. The motor system carries signals to skeletal muscle muscles that can be voluntary or involuntary. The autonomic nervous system regulates smooth and cardiac muscles and is generally voluntary, involuntary. The autonomic nervous system has a sympathetic, parasympathetic, and enteric divisions. The enteric division controls the activity of the digestive tract, the pan pancreas, and the gallbladder. The sympathetic division regulates the fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic division uh, generates the opposite response in the target organs and promotes calming and return to rest and digest functions. Okay, the vertebrate brain is regionally specialized. We look at the human brain, it contains a hundred billion neurons. These cells are organized into circuits that can perform highly sophisticated uh, information processing, storage and retrieval. And uh, most of these functions are, are segmented into uh, regions that specifically handled different responses. Okay, the brain is the most complex organ of the human body. It's surrounded by the thick bones of the skull, and the brain is divided into a set of distinctive structures, some of which are visible in the magnetic resonance imaging here. here. Um, this is an adult's head, and the diagram below, uh, the on the next few pages, we're going to go through the diagram, which uh, traces the development of these structures in the embryo. Okay, so here, in, 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 there's the cerebellum here, the brain, uh, the cortex here, um, the, uh, the hypothalamus, the um, spinal cord, all of these are... Uh, organs that we're going to go in uh, in greater detail. Okay, uh, here is basically how uh, an, an embryonic 
brain develops into a child's brain. When the embryo first develops about at about uh, one month, four weeks, uh, there's three major sections, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. Um, after a, after to, uh, time, about five to six weeks, um, <clears throat> specialization begins to develop, and we have the telencephalon, the diencephalon, the mesencephalon, the met metaencephalon, and the myelencephalon. These all develop from these different regions. Okay, so then the uh, telencephalon is going to develop into the cerebrum, which includes the cerebral cortex, the white matter, and the basal nuclei. The diencephalon, this, this region here in the center of the brain, is going to become the uh, thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus, okay, all parts of uh, controlling the endocrine system uh, eventually. The midbrain becomes the mesencephalon, and that becomes the uh, part of the brain stem. Okay, down here, uh, the midbrain has its own function that we're going to go into in, the, in a little bit here. Then the hindbrain develops into the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. The metencephalon becomes the pons, which is part of the brain stem, and the myelencephalon becomes part of the medulla oblongata the part of the uh, major part of the brain stem. Okay, here's a uh, just a breakdown of that. Here's the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. They develop into the telencephalon, the diencephalon, the mesencephalon. Okay, and uh, those develop into the different regions of the brain. Okay, here is a, an illustration of the cerebrum. Now we're going to go through um, the cerebrum, the cerebellum, the diencephalon, and the brain stem. We're going to describe them in greater detail in the next couple of slides here. The cerebrum controls skeletal muscles contraction and is the center for learning, emotion, memory, and perception. It's divided into the right and left cerebral hemispheres. The cerebral cortex is the vital for perception. The cortex, as you recall, is, the, is like the outer covering of an organ. So the cerebral cortex is vital for perception, voluntary movement, and learning. Like the rest of the cerebrum, the cerebral cortex is divided into right and left sides. The left side receives information from and controls the movement of the right side of the body, and vice versa. The, the thick band of axons known as the corpus callosum, which is uh, located here in the middle between the two, uh, between the two um, uh, hemispheres, um, enables the right and left cerebral cortices to communicate. Deep within the white matter, Clusters of neurons called basal nuclei serve as centers for planning and learning man mo movement sequences. Damage to these sites during fetal development can result in cerebral palsy and dis a disorder <coughs> resulting from the disruption in the transmission of motor commands to the muscles. Okay, the cerebellum, shown here below in blue, is coordinates movement and balance and helps to uh, learning and, and motor skills. Uh, the cerebellum is actually impaired by the use of alcohol and that explains why when people are when uh, the police are doing a field alcohol test um, before they do a breathalyzer, a breathalyzer the, the police will um, ask you to stand on one leg or walk down a straight line on the side of the road um, and if you're a, 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 unable to do that, it indicates that your cerebellum is impaired and th therefore you may have uh, alcohol impairment. If that's the case, then they may take it to the next stage with a, a breathalyzer which measures your blood alcohol content. The cerebellum coordinates movement and balance and helps in learning and remembering motor skills. The cerebellum receives sensory information about the positions of the joint and links of the muscles as well as input from the auditory and visual systems. It also monitors mo motor commands issued by the cerebrum. 
The cerebellum integrates this function as it carries out coordination and error checking during motor perceptual functions. Hand-eye coordination, for example, uh, is an example of cere cerebellar control. If the cerebellum is damaged, the eyes can follow a moving object, but they will not stop at the same place as the object. Um, hand movement co toward the object will also be erratic. Okay, that's the other thing the police do. They'll take a pen and put it in front of your face and uh, uh, wave it back and forth. And if you're if you are impaired, then your eyes will uh, go past the point where it's. Don't ask me how I know all this. Okay, the uh, diencephalon, uh, which is a region inside the brain here uh, that contains the thalamus, the pineal glands, the hypothalamus, and the pituitary gland. Um, the diencephalon gives rise to the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. The thalamus is the main input center for the sensory information going to the cerebrum. Uh, <clears throat> so all the information, incoming information from all the senses is sorted in the thalamus and sent to the appropriate cerebral centers for further processing. The thalamus is formed by two masses, each roughly the size and shape of a walnut. The, a much smaller structure, the hypothalamus, constitutes a control center that, that includes the body's thermostat as well as the central biological clock. Through its regulation of the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus regulates hunger and thirst, plays a role in sexual and mating behaviors, and initiates the fight or flight response. The hypothalamus is also the source of the posterior pituitary hormones and of releasing hormones that act on the anterior pituitary. The epithalamus includes the pineal gland, the source of melatonin. It is a, also contains one of the several clusters of capillaries that generate cerebral spinal fluid from the blood. Okay, the brain stem, which is uh, what we like to call the primitive brain or the reptil reptilian brain. Uh, the brain stem consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata, commonly known as the medulla. The midbrain receives and integrates several types of sensory information, which is then sent on to the specific regions of the forebrain. All sensory axons involving hearing either terminate in the midbrain or pass through it on their way to the cerebrum. In addition, the midbrain coordinates visual reflexes such as peripheral vision reflex. The head turns toward an object approaching from the side without the brain having formed an image of the object. The uh, major function of the pons and medulla is the transfer information between the peripheral nervous system and the midbrain and the forebrain. The pons and medulla also help coordinate large-scale body movements such as running and climbing. Most axons that carry instructions about these movements cross from one side of the central nervous system to the other in the medulla. As a result, the res this right side of the brain controls much of the movement in the, as the left side of the brain and vice versa. An additional function of the medulla is the control of several automatic homeostatic functions, including breathing, heart and blood vessel activity, swallowing, vomiting, and digestion. The pons also participates in some of these activities. For example, it regulates the breathing centers of the medulla. Okay, so this is when, in, when, when your, when your uh, blood uh, has too much carbon dioxide in it, Got carbon, carbonic acid uh, affects the uh, medulla oblongata and that uh, through the cerebrospinal tissue, and that means you have to exhale. So that's part of the respiratory system. Arousal and uh, sleep. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Uh, arousal is a state of awareness to the external world. Uh, sleep is the state in which external slim, uh, stimuli are received but not consciously perceived. Arousal and sleep are controlled in part by clusters of neurons in the midbrain and the pons. 
Sleep is an active state for the brain and is regulated by the biological clock and the regions of the forebrain, which regulate the intensity of, and duration of sleep. Some animals have evolutionary adaptations that allow for activity during sleep. Like, for example, dolphins, uh, in one, uh, only one side of the brain is asleep at a time. So the dolphin can swim through the, uh, the water and, uh, and its uh, left, uh, the left cerebrum is uh, asleep and then, uh, and then it uh, can rest that, that brain half, that half of the brain, and then the other half of the brain will go to sleep and the left half will wake up. Okay, here's uh, low frequency waves, and characteristic of sleep in uh, dolphins. Okay, uh, this just shows that uh, uh, low frequency are characteristic of sleep and high frequency of wakefulness. Okay, left hemisphere and right hemisphere, the different hemispheres are alternating in the dolphin. Biological clock regulation, uh, cycles of sleep and wake wakefulness are examples of circadian rhythms, daily cycles of biological activity. Mammalian circadian rhythms rely on biological clock, a, mon a molecular uh, mechanism that uh, directs periodic gene expression. Biological clocks are typically synchronized to light and dark cycles in roughly 24-hour cycle. Uh, biological clock regulation is usually orchestrated by the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is a uh, central uh, region in the brain that uh, helps to, to control um, the, the biological clock. In mammals, circadian rhythms are coordinated by a group of neurons of the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The suprachiasmatic nucleus acts as a pacemaker synchronizing the biological clock. Okay. <clears throat> Now uh, we'll talk a little bit about emotions. The generation and experience of emotions is involved in, in involve many brain structures, including the amygdala, the hippocampus, and parts of the thalamus, all parts of the central brain. These structures are grouped as the limbic system. Generation and experience of emotion also requires interaction between limbic system and sensory areas of the cerebrum. The brain system, the brain structure that is most important for emotional memory is the amygdala. <clears throat> okay. Um, whereas the single structure of brain controls the biological clock, generating and experiencing emotions depend on many st brain structures, including the amygdala, hippocampus, and parts of the thalamus. These structures border the brainstem in, ma in mammals and therefore term the limbic structure. Limbus means border. Generating and experiencing emotion often require interactions between different regions of the brain. For example, laughing and crying both involve the limbic system, interacting with sensory areas of the forebrain. Similarly, structures in the forebrain attach emotional feelings to survival-related uh, functions controlled by the brainstem, including aggression and feeding and sexuality. Emotional responses, emotional experiences are sometimes stored as memories and can be recalled by similar circumstances. For example, a situation that causes you to remember a frightening event can trigger a faster heart rate, sweating, and a mental state of fear. Even if there is currently nothing scary or threatening in your surroundings, the brain structure that is most important for this emotion of membrane is called the amygdala. The brain's reward and drug, drug addiction. The brain's reward system provides motivation for activities that enhance survival and reproduction. The brain's reward system is dramatically affected by drug addiction. Drug addiction is characterized by compulsive consumption and inability to control intake. Active drug, addictive drugs such as cocaine, amphetamine, heroin, alcohol, tobacco enhance the activity of the dopamine pathway. Drug addiction leads to long-lasting changes in the reward circuitry that causes a craving for a drug. 
these addiction, these addictive cravings can also be caused um, by by other um, by other causes. Like uh, people can be addicted to uh, gambling or eating or sexual activity. Um, all, all of these uh, uh, in, in occur in the same kind of reinforcing that that uh, same uh, neuronal pathway. Um, here we see uh, addictive drugs that alter the transmission of signals in the pathway formed by neurons in the ventral tegumental area. Uh, for example, here heroin and uh, opium in decrease activity of the inhibitory uh, neuron. So with the decrease of the inhibitory neuron, uh, neuron allows uh, increased um, uh, production of neurons. Nic nicotine uh, stimulates dopamine and releases uh, the uh, ventral tegumental area neuron. Um, do uh, okay, so this is the this is the dopamine releasing neuron. This is the inhibitory neuron. So the inhibitory neuron can be impaired by opium and heroin and then it allows the dopamine releasing uh, to occur. Um, the uh, nicotine stimulates the dopamine. The cerebral neuron uh, of the reward pathway, okay, and this gives the reward uh, response, which could be a, a sense of uh, well-being or uh, contentment. And that would be, uh, that's one ex uh, example, and um, like I said, the, these these pathways can be stimulated by behaviors as well as drugs. Uh, functional imaging of the brain. The functional imaging uh, methods are transforming our understanding of normal and diseased brains. In positron emission tomography, uh, the an injection of radioactive glucose enables the display of meta metabolic activity. In functional magnetic renaissance, uh, uh, resonance imaging, this is MRIs, which is uh, pretty common. People use MRIs a lot in, uh, me in the medical field. The subject lies with his or head -ish in the center of a large donut-shaped magnet, and brain activity is detected by changes in local oxygen concentrations. Applications of MRI include monitoring recovery from a stroke, uh, mapping abnormalities in migraine headaches and increasing the effectiveness of brain surgery. Okay, so here's a uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, that was used to reveal brain activity associated with happy or sad music. So if you had happy music, you had gr a greater stimulation of the brain. If you had sad music, you had lower stimulation of the brain. The cerebral cortex controls voluntary movement and cognitive functions. When we think of the brain, what we're normally thinking of is the activities that occur in the cerebral cortex. The cerebrum is essential for language, cognition, memory, consciousness, and our awareness of our surroundings. The cognitive functions remain, reside mainly in the cortex, the outer layer. Four regions or lobes, the frontal, temporal, occipital, and parietal are landmarks for particular functions. Okay, so uh, the frontal lobe is uh, mostly credited with our uh, uh, decision-making, thinking, and planning. Um, uh, the motor cortex uh, is uh, back towards the center of the brain. This is what uh, controls the uh, skeletal muscles. Uh, the parietal lobe, which is in the kind of middle of the brain, uh, has to do with uh, sensory input, uh, somatosensory cortex, the sense of touch in particular, uh, sensory association with cortex, the, uh, the integration of sensory information, um, particularly responding to uh, touch. Um, the occipital lobe is uh, mostly associated with the visual cortex, um, the, uh, the uh, object recognition and combining um, 
images and object recognition occurs in the occipital row. So here's your eyeballs up here in the front and they get basically shoot that information straight back to the visual cortex. Uh, here's the cerebellum, which as we talked about is uh, responsible for uh, coordination, physical coordination. Uh, there's Wernicke's area right up here in the temporal lobe, the, uh, the, the uh, upper region of the temporal lobe. That's associated with comprehending language. And there's the auditory co cortex uh, responsible for hearing in particular. So it's good that hearing and language comprehension are right uh, close together there. And that's all together on the temp temporal lobe. Now one of the, the ways that uh, we understand the function of all these different um, parts of the brain is because when someone has a stroke in a certain uh, particular vessel that affects a, a particular region of that brain, that person will be, that person's uh, function will be affected in that brain. So uh, somebody could have a stroke that has, uh, um, affects their uh, ability to comprehend language and then they, they might not be able to understand what's going on around them. They, they could be, um, confused by uh, people speaking language around them. You could have a, a typically uh, strokes do affect the Broca's region, um, which um, a, a often affects the ability to form speech. And people with uh, strokes in this region will have slurred speech and uh, inability to make uh, coherent sentences. Um, and, the, and the same goes for all these different regions. One of the re one of the ways that we know that these region that these regions are affect those um, conditions those uh, parameters are is because they are uh, affected by the various strokes that can occur. The mapping of cognitive functions within the cortex began in the 1800s. Broca's area in the left frontal lobe is a, a, is active when speech is generated. Wernicke's lobe is in the posterior of the left frontal lobe. It's an act, it's active when speech is heard. Okay, so here's a uh, MRI that shows, um, or this is a P, uh, positron positron uh, emission tomography images that show regions with. Uh, different activity levels in one person's brain during four activities related to speech. Hearing words activates Wernicke's area, speaking words activates Broca's area, seeing words activates the visual cortex, and, and uh, generating words uh, without reading them activates uh, parts of the frontal cortex. Okay, so here's the front of the brain here, generating words. Okay, you can see all these different uh, fa uh, functions here. Hearing words um, affects the Wernicke's area. Okay, so all these uh, different areas are being affected. Uh, seeing words, the visual cortex, speaking words affects the, uh, it shows the uh, Broca's region. Uh, oh, okay, so all those different areas are affected in that uh, with this PET scan. Okay, lateralization of cortical function. The left side of the cerebrum is dominant regarding language, math, and logical operations. The right side uh, hemisphere is uh, dominant in recognition of faces, patterns, and spatial relations, and nonverbal thinking. And the establishment of uh, in hemisphere function is called lateralization. My, I have a cousin who's left-handed, and he used to say, "If the if the uh, if the right if the left hand side of the brain controls the right hand, and the left and the right side of the brain controls the um, so if the if the if the left side of the brain controls the right hand, and the right side of the brain controls the left hand, then only left-handed people are in their right minds." Ha ha, get it. Okay, two hemispheres exchange information through the fibers of the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum is the region uh, between the brains that there's like an actual physical structure that, contain, that connects the two hemispheres. Severing this connection results in a split brain effect 
in which the two hemispheres operate independently. The cerebral cortex uh, receives input from sensory organs and somatosen somatosensory receptors. Somatosensory receptors provide information about touch, pain, pressure, temperature, and the position of the muscles and limbs. The thalamus directs different types of input to, different, to distinct locations. Uh, frontal lobe damage may impair decision making and emotional responses, but leave intellect and memory intact. The frontal lobes have a substantial effect on executive functions. Okay, here's the example of Phineas Gage. Okay, this guy was a railroad worker and he got a pipe um, shot up through his brain. Apparently he survived through it and he walked around with a pipe in the middle of his head for the rest of his days. But his personality changed dramatically. He became emotionally detached and impatient and erratic in his behavior. Um, uh, it, so um, they, they were able to speculate that the region of the brain that, that, that occurred that this damage had occurred affected those re, uh, those behaviors. Okay, in nearly all vertebrates, the brain has the same number of divisions. Hypothesis that higher order reasoning requires a highly convoluted cerebral cortex has been experimentally refuted. Anatomical basis for sophisticated information processing in birds without a highly convoluted neocortex appears to be a cluster of nuclei in the top or outer portion of the brain, the pallium. And we know that birds can solve problems like uh, um, crows can solve simple puzzles and uh, they can do all kinds of uh, in interesting things that were considered to be higher, uh, higher order functioning. Um, here's the uh, bird brain which the uh, cerebrum including the pallium uh, this is the region here that they, they uh, believe to affect higher order functioning. And here's in a human brain. You can see there's a greater uh, deal of, uh, of convolute, convolute in the, in the uh, cerebral cortex. Comparison of regions for higher cognition in the avian and human brains. Although structurally different, the pallium of the songbird in the top cross section and the cerebral cortex of the human brain, bottom cross section, play similar roles in higher cognitive activities and make many similar connections along with other brain structures. Neuroplasticity is the capacity of the nervous system to be modified after birth. So sometimes when you have a stroke and it affects your uh, ability uh, to reason or affects your ability to form sentences, uh, you can learn um, to uh, compensate for that. And that process of uh, learning to compensate involves um, neuroplasticity. Changes can strengthen or weaken signaling at a synapse. In autism, a developmental disorder involves a disruption of activity dependent uh, remo remodeling at synapses. Children with autism display impaired communication and social interaction, as well as stereotyped repetitive behaviors. <clears throat> okay, here we see uh, connections between the neurons that are strengthened or weakened in response to activity. And the, in the, uh, l we'll look at these um, two, these two uh, examples here. Uh, high level activity at the synapse of the postsynaptic neuron with the presynaptic neuron leads to recruitment of additional axon terminals from that neuron. Lack of an activity of a synapse uh, with presynaptic neuron N2 here is uh, leads to the functional to the loss of functional connections with that neuron. Okay, so. Uh, the more the more you think about something, for example, the stronger that bond is going to become. The less you think about something, the the uh, weaker that bond is to become. Okay, and this has to do with uh, any kind of sensory perception here. Um, if you are constantly feeling a certain 
uh, response, then uh, you're going to have a stronger connection with those um, with those synapses to the axon. Here below, if two synapses on the same postsynaptic cell are active at the same time, the strength of the postsynaptic responses may increase these at both synapses. So this is one way, like for example, an addi addiction can become strengthened through time and uh, so that somebody in an addiction, like they take like mice and they experiment on mice and the, and the mice will forego food or mating in, in uh, only to obtain more of the drug. And that's because those uh, synaptic uh, connections are, are being um, strengthened. Synaptic connections can change over time depending on the activity level at the synapse. Memory and learning. Uh, neuroplasticity is essential to formation of memories. Short-term memory is accessed via the hippocampus and the hippocampus also plays a role in forming long-term memory which is stored in the cerebral cortex. Some consolidation of memory is thought to occur during sleep. Okay, uh, sensory receptors transduce stimulus energy and transmit signals to the central nervous system. Much brain activity begins with the sensory input. A sensory receptor detects a stimulus which alters the transmission of action potentials to the central nervous system. This, the information decoded in the central nervous system uh, resulting in a sensation. A sensory pathway begins with sensory reception, detection of stimuli by sensory receptors. Sensory receptors which detect stimuli interact directly with stimuli both inside and outside the body. Sensory transduction is the uh, conversion of stimulus energy into a change in which the membrane potential of the sensory receptor. This change in membrane potential is called the receptor potential. Receptor potentials are graded. Their magnitude varies with the strength of the stimulus. Okay, so here you have a stimulus affecting a nerve directly. Um, it it travels through the to the afferent nerve neuron to the central nervous system or then you may have a, a, a stimulus affecting a, 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 a sensory receptor cell and this receptor cell can release transmitters to the next um, uh, neuron here and uh, it travels across the synapse and into the uh, afferent neuron to the central nervous system. The term sensory receptor is used to describe a sensory cell or organ as well as a subcellular structure that detects stimuli. Many sensory receptors detect stimuli from outside the body such as heat or chemicals, but there are also receptors for stimuli within the body such as blood pressure. Activating a sensory receptor does not necessarily require a large amount of stimulus energy. For example, most light receptors can, can uh, detect a single photon of light. Sensory information is transmitted as nerve impulses or action potentials. Neurons that actly act directly as sensory receptors produce action potentials and have an axon that extends into the central nervous system. Non-neuronal sensory receptors form chemical synapses with sensory neurons. They typically respond to stimuli by increasing the rate at which the sensory neurons produce action potentials. The response of a sensory receptor varies with intensity of stimuli. If the, se if the receptor is a neuron, the, a larger receptor potential results in more frequent action potentials. If the receptor is not a neuron, a larger receptor potential causes more neurotransmitter to, to be released.
Okay, so um, here's an example of uh, uh, coding of stimulus intensity by a single sensory receptor. Okay, you, uh, varying the f pressure on this uh, on this uh, sensory receptor will cause uh, either low frequency of action potentials with gentle pressure or high frequency. The, so the more input you're getting, you're getting a higher frequency of action potentials. Perception is the brain's construction of stimuli. Action potentials from sensory receptors travel along neurons that are dedicated to a particular stimulus. The brain thus distinguishes stimuli such as light or sound solely by the path along which the action potentials have arrived. Amplification is the strengthening of stimulus energy by cells in the sensory pathway. Sensory adaptation is the decrease in sensory responses to continued stimulation. So if you're feeling a continu uh, the same stimulation continuously over time, you may become desensitized to that stimulation. Uh, based on energy transduced, sensory receptors fall into five categories. Uh, they are mechanoreceptors, uh, typically um, organ, uh, receptors that are involved in touch, electromagnetic receptors, uh, typically uh, receptors that involve with vision, uh, thermoreceptors, uh, receptors that are involved with sensing uh, variation in heat, uh, pain receptors, also called noise receptors, these are uh, receptors that are that, that uh, specifically uh, can s sense, uh, you know, um, painful situations. They go from mechan they're related to mechanical receptors, uh, but they can be, uh, you know, you could be blinded. That could in in indicate uh, pain receptors in action. And chemoreceptors. And chemoreceptors are like taste and touch and uh, or taste and smell. Mechanoreceptors re sense physical deformation caused by stimuli such as pressure, touch, stretch, motion, and sound. Some animals use mechanoreceptors to get a feel for their environment. Remember we looked at the um, at the uh, star-nosed mole, Condylora cristata, in the beginning of this lecture. Uh, those are mechanoreceptors on its nose. Um, for example, cats and many rodents have sensitive whiskers that provide detailed information about ne nearby structures. So rat, rodents and cats, they're, they're able to sense if they can get through a small hole based on the information that they get from their mechanoreceptors from their whiskers. Electromagnetic receptors de detect electromagnetic energy such as light, electricity, and magnetism. Uh, some s snakes have uh, very sensitive infrared receptors that detect body heat of prey against colder background. And many animals apparently use, uh, migrate using the Earth's magnetic field to orient themselves. In addition to this, uh, uh, some animals like the duck-billed platypus is able to detect um, uh, electromagnetism of its prey, principally uh, crayfish. Uh, in the streams in which it lives, and it uses its duck bill as it probes along the the uh, rocks and sediments on the bottom of the creeks that it lives in to uh, turn up um, the uh, crayfish, which it then uh, snaps down and eats. Okay, so here's a rattlesnake. A rattlesnake is a type of snake called a pit viper, and a lot of the a lot of venomous snakes are pit vipers. They haven't infrared receptor uh, or pit located uh, right um, under their eyes. Uh, they don't have, uh, snakes don't generally have uh, noses because they have, they sense their environment, they sense their, uh, their um, chemoreceptors are their tongue. So with, when they, they stick out their, their forked tongue and then they bring it back into their mouth and they slip it up into an organ, called the vomeral nasal organ in the top of their mouth, and that's how they sense their uh, chemical environment. But their infrared environment, uh, they're able to, uh, pit vipers are able to sense using these infrared receptors, and they can, uh, in the complete darkness, they can detect when a 
uh, mammal, uh, mouse, prey item might be in that area. Uh, within striking distance, as they say. Um, here are beluga whales, which it's, it's believed that uh, most of the cetaceans, uh, uh, porpoises and baleen whales are able to uh, navigate using uh, uh, magnetic fields. Uh, this goes for migratory birds as well. So any of your like ma animals that have uh, major migratory pathways, they can be uh, oriented on the Earth's electromagnetic field, just like a compass. Thermoreceptors detect heat and cold. Uh, in humans, thermoreceptors in the skin and anterior hypothalamus uh, send information to the body's thermos, thermostat in the posterior hypothalamus to help regulate uh, body temperature. In humans, pain receptors or noci receptors, nocice receptors, detect stimuli that reflect conditions that could damage animal tissue. So if you're about to get burned, that's when your uh, pain receptors come into play. By triggering defensive actions such as withdrawal from danger, pain perception serves as an important uh, function. So these are basically affected, uh, these are basically associated with your reflex responses. Remember your reflexes go directly to, to your uh, to the spinal column and they do not pass go, they do not go to the brain, they just they just uh, active response immediately from the central nervous system. Chemicals such as prostaglandins worsen pain by increasing receptor sensitivity to noxious stimuli. Aspirin and ibuprofen reduce pain by inhibiting synthesis of prostaglandins. General chemoreceptors transmit information uh, to, uh, about the total solute concentrations of a solution. Uh, specific chemoreceptors respond to individual kinds of molecules. Olfaction is smell and gustation is taste. Both depend on chemoreceptors. The smell is the detection of odorants carried in the air and taste is the detec detection of tastants pre present in solution. Humans can distinguish thousands of different colors. Humans and other mammals re recognize just five types of tastants, sweet, sour, salt, bitter, and umami. Umami is a Japanese word that means savory. Taste receptors are organized into taste buds mostly found in projections called papillae. Any region of the tongue can detect any of the five types of taste. Okay, so here's a uh, diagram of the tongue. Uh, in this, uh, above here we see the, the tongue specifically in uh, all its glory. Sm small raised structures called papillae cover the tongue, the surface, and the enlarged cross section shows the sidewall of the papillae uh, with the taste buds inside. So the taste buds are inside, and the papillae cover the tongue here. Um, each uh, taste bud in all regions of the tongue contains sensory receptors that speci that's specific for each of the five taste types. Okay, here are the five taste types down here, and each of these taste buds, um, it it's also I've read that uh, you, you different regions of your tongue are 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 geared towards each one of these uh, tastes. Like your salty may be on the side of your tongue, and your sweet is um, right in the middle. Okay, uh, but they don't cover that here in in this in this book. Okay, so here's the taste the food molecules, they come in here and they're going to stimulate each one of these five different, or one of these different five, or some combination, you know, you, you could have a different combination of these different uh, taste buds, and that will relate, relate to your different uh, tastes.
Mechanoreceptors are responsible for hearing and equilibrium detect uh, and, and equilibrium detection moving fluid or settling particles. Hearing and perception of the body equilibrium are related in most animals. For most, for both senses, settling particles or moving fluid is detected by mechanoreceptors. The most invertebrates maintain equilibrium using mechanoreceptors in organs called statocysts. Statocysts contain mechanoreceptors that detect the movement of granules called statoliths. A, most insects sense sounds with body hairs that vibrate or with localized vibration sensitive organs con consisting of a tympanic membrane stretched over an internal chamber. Okay, here's the, uh, here's the um, invertebrate uh, lo uh, localization sensor, the statocyst of an invertebrate. The settling of granules called statoliths in the low part of the chamber bends cilia on receptor cells that, in that location, providing the brain with information about the orientation of the body with respect to gravity. Okay, so when the this is it, this is uh, sensory nerve fibers going to the central nervous system or the of the uh, invertebrate, and this the and this is the uh, the invertebrate standing face up. But if it's turn it over, then these statoliths uh, roll around onto this side, and they stimulate this part of the of the uh, receptor cells, mechanoreceptors here, and then uh, that that tells it that the um, organism is inverted. The most terrestrial vertebrates sensory organs for hearing and equilibrium are closely associated in the ear. Okay, um, I'm going to try to go over these uh, 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 an overview and then, uh, and then we'll go into uh, them in greater detail. Uh, so here's an overview of the ear structure. The outer ear consists of the external pinnae oh, uh, uh, and the auditory canal, which collects sound waves and then channel them into the tympanic membrane, or eardrum, which separates the outer ear from the middle ear. In the middle ear, there are three small bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Transmit, they transmit vibrations to the oval window, which is the membrane which is the membrane beneath the stapes the middle ear also opens into the eustachian tube which connects the pharynx and equalizes pressure between the middle ear and the atmosphere the the inner ear consists of fluid filled chambers including the semicircular canals which function in the equilibrium and the coiled cochlea which from the Latin meaning snail, a bony cham chamber that is involved in hearing. Okay, so this eustachian tube, if you are uh, a scuba diver, this is very important. What you have to do is uh, pinch your nose and blow out in order to equalize pressure uh, between, your, between the inner ear and the, um, and the surrounding environment. If you don't do that, you can actually pop your tympanic membrane. You can pop your eardrum. So here's the, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. These are uh, the uh, bones um, that are very important in hearing. They transmit vibration from the tympanic membrane to, uh, uh, to the um, cochlea. And then uh, here's the semicir semicircular canals. These are involved in, um, in the um, uh, ability of the of the person to orient themselves, uh, tell which way is up and down. Um, and then here's the uh, auditory nerve that goes uh, to the brain. And we're going to go into this in quite a bit of detail here. Okay, um, the cochlea, which is, uh, this is a cross section of the cochlea here, um, has two canals, an upper vestibular canal here and a lower uh, tympanic canal here. Um, they are separated by a smaller cochlear duct. Both canals are, are filled with fluid. 
Okay, so these are the canals that are filled with fluid here, the vestibular and the tympanic. Now the cochlear du duct here, this is where hearing occurs. It occurs in the organ of, of corti, and then it goes to the auditory nerve, and the auditory nerve goes to the brain, where the sound is perceived and interpreted. Okay, here, um, here is the organ of corti. The floor of the cochlear duct, which is um, uh, the basilar membrane, bears the organ of corti, which is this little organ right here. And see these little mechanoreceptors? That's, uh, those, are, those are the same kind of receptors that are involved in your touch. Uh, um, uh, so they are mechanoreceptors. They're not uh, chemoreceptors. They, but they, ha they deal with the uh, vibration of the, of the, um, of the, what, the sound that you're getting input from the, from the am ambient environment. Okay, so the floor of the cochlear duct, the basilar membrane, bears the organ of corti which contains the mechanoreceptors of the ear, hair cells, which, which, with hairs projecting into the cochlear duct. Many of the hairs are attached to the tectoral membrane, which hangs over the organ of corti like an awning. Sound waves make the basilar vi membrane vibrate, which results in the bending of the hairs and the depolarization of the cells. So your sound membrane comes in um, it's interesting because high-pitched sounds uh, activate the area near um, the auditory nerve here, and low-pitched sounds activate the area further away. So uh, th those sounds will uh, they they will cause these uh, hair cells to vibrate, and then they will be uh, vibrate against the tectoral membrane, and then that will uh, release the stimulus that release the uh, the um, Neuro, the neurotransmitters, the sensory perception into the nerves and travel to the brain. These hair cells are, are uh, projecting from each hair cell as a bundle of rod-shaped hairs, which uh, in, in each containing a core of actin filaments. Vibration of the basilar membrane in response to the sound raises and lowers the hair cells, bending the hairs against the surrounding fluid and the tectoral membrane. When the hairs in the, the bundle are displaced, the mechanoreceptors are activated, changing the uh, membrane potential of the hair cell. So this is a super simplified way of looking at hearing. And you can, you can hear like all kinds of nuances and different sounds, and do, well, depending on what kind of music or what, just what you're hearing in the environment around you, different volumes and different pitches. Um, they all, uh, they, they, this is a very simplified way of looking at it, but it's, a, it's an amazing organ, the ear. Okay, vibrating objects create pressure waves in the air, which are transduced by ear into nerve impulses and perceived as sound in the brain. The tympanic membrane vibrates in response to vibrations in the air. The three bones of the middle ear transmit the vibrations of the moving air to the oval window on the cochlea. The vibrations of the bones in the middle ear create pressure waves that, uh, in the fluid of the cochlea that tra travel through the vestibular canal. Tra pressure waves in the canal cause the basilar membrane to vibrate and, and attach hair cells to vibrate. The bending of these hair cells causes ion channels in the hair cells to open or close, resulting in a change of auditory nerve sensations that the brain interprets as sound. Okay, so here's the uh, hair cells uh, bending in one direction. It could cause more neurotransmitters to be released. And then the hair cells bending in another trans, uh, direction, they could cause uh, fewer hair cells to release. So bending of a hair cell in one direction depolarizes the hair cell. This increases the neurotransmitter result, result uh, resulting in frequent potentials or se uh, in the sensory neuron. Bending in the other direction has the opposite effects. So um, this could be uh, uh, this increase in potential could be um, uh, pitch or volume.
Pitch is a function of the sound waves and the number of vibrations per unit time. High frequency waves produce high pitch sounds, whereas low frequency waves produce low pitch sounds. The cochlea can distinguish pitch because the basilar membrane is not uniform along its length. It, it is relatively narrow at the stiff base of the cochlea near the oval window and wider and more flexible at the apex. Each region of the basilar membrane is uh, tuned to a particular frequency or vibration. Signals uh, tr triggered by these sounds are relayed to specific parts of the cerebral cortex according to the region of the basilar membrane in which signals originated. So one thing that you can, uh, that's important to understand is that this little slice of the, of the cochlea here, it's uh, the slice of the cochlea comes out here right where it says cochlea. Um, that's, normally that's uh, connected. And this is, these little hairs they they are line they're uniform and they line they're not uniform but they they are line the internal structure of this hair so where these vibrations occur uh, they they register on different regions of the of the uh, of the ear of the inner ear the cochlea here and depending on where those vibrations register that's where that uh, that um, nerve is stimulated and then that nerve that stimulated nerve goes to the uh, the auditory nerve goes to the brain. So there's um, all these these nerves are not. This is not one little set. This is one little section of a whole uh, region that goes around that that whole uh, semicircular canal. I mean, not the semicircular canal, but the cochlea is all um, lined with these uh, um, organs of corti. So there's there's multiples of them throughout the. Uh, throughout the canal. Okay. So, depending on which way those hair cells, it can be a uh, different pitch. The fluid waves dissipate when they strike the round window at the end of the vestibular canal. The ear conveys information about volume, the amplitude of sound, and pitch, the frequency of the sound waves. The cochlea can distinguish pitch because its basilar membrane is not uniform along its length. Each region of the basilar membrane is tuned to a particular vibration frequency. Several organs in the inner ear detect body movement and balance. This is equilibrium. This is your ability to stand upright. The utricle and saccule contain granules called otoliths that allow us to perceive position relative to gravity or linear movement. Three semicircular canals contain fluid that, contain, that can detect angular movement in any direction. Okay, so here are the semicircular canals. They're arranged in three spatial planes and detect angular movements of the head. The swelling at the, 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 swelling at the base of each canal contains a cluster of, of hair cells. So these, these are filled with fluid and they have these little otoliths down here in the bottom. These otoliths detect uh, which way that fluid is moving. The utricle and the saccule um, Here's the, uh, the utricle and the saccule, these two different uh, parts of the brain here, of the, of the ear. The utricle and saccule tell the brain which way is up and inform it of the body's position and linear acceleration. The, the, hairs, of the, the hairs of the hair cell project into a gelatinous cap called the cupola. When the head starts or stops rotating, the fluid, the paralymph of the semicircular canal, presses against the cupola, bending the hairs. Bending of the hairs increases the frequency of the action potentials in the neurons and the sensory neurons in direct proportion to the amount of rotational acceleration. So if you whip your head around real quick, it's going to cause these, um, it's going to cause the fluid to um, strike the cupola and then it's got that depending on how hard it strikes the cupola, it's going to activate these cells 
and that's going to release uh, nerve impulses uh, with greater frequency the faster that your head is moving around. So when you're going on a uh, when you're going on a roller coaster in in uh, King's Dominion, um, basically what happened is you're stimulating the otolith in your in your um, in your inner ear, ear canal. You're stimulating the copula. Uh, when the, the fluid is traveling over the copula and uh, stimulating your uh, nerves to your to your brain. Okay, now the diverse visual receptors of animals depend on light absorbing pigments. The organs used for vision vary considerably among animals, but the very the underlying mechanism for capturing light is the same. Light detectors in animals range from simple clusters of cells that detect direction and intensity of light to complex organs that form images, shapes, and colors. Light detection all contain photoreceptors, cells that contain light-absorbing pigment molecules. Most invertebrates have a light-detecting organ. One of the simplest light-detecting organs is that of the planarians. It has a pair of ocelli called eye spots that are located near the head. These allow planarians to move away from light and seek shaded locations. Okay, so here's the simple eyes of the, of the uh, planarian. The planarian's brain directs the body to turn until the sensations from the two ocelli are equal and minimal. They're causing the uh, planaria to move away from light. So they're not really eyes, but they are they're light detectors. Whereas light striking the front of the ocella strikes, uh, excites the uh, photoreceptors, light striking the back is blocked by the screening pigment. In this way, the ocelli indicate the direction of light and the light source and triggering the light avoidance behavior. Insects and crustaceans have compound eyes which consist of up to several thousand light detectors called omatidia. Compound eyes are very effective at detecting movement. This is why it's so difficult to swat a fly. Because the, uh, the fly is looking out through these and this compound eyes in all these different directions. The faceted eyes on the head of a fly form a repeating pattern visible in this phyto photomicrograph. Single lens eyes are found in some jellies, polychaetes, spiders, and many mollusks. They work on a camera-like principle. The iris changes in diameter of the pupil uh, to control the, how much light enters. The eyes of all vertebrates have a single lens. Vision begins when photons of the light enter the eye and strike the rods and cones. However, it is the brain that sees. Okay, uh, now we're going to go and look at the overview of the eye structure. Starting from the outside, the human eye is surrounded by a conjunctiva, a mucous membrane, which is not shown in this diagram, the sclera, a connective tissue, and the choroid. Choroid, a thin pigmented layer at the, at the front. The sclera forms the transport, transparent cornea and the choroid forms the iris, the colored iris. By changing size, the iris regulates the amount of light entering the pupil and the whole of the center of the iris, just inside the choroid. The, the neurons and the photoreceptors of the retina form the innermost layer of the eyeball. The optic nerve exists in the eye of the optic disc. The lens, a transparent disc of protein, divides the eye into two cavities. The front of the lens is li in front of the lens lies the aqueous humor, a clear water substance. The the uh, blockage of ducts and drain this fluid ca cause glaucoma, a condition which decreases the increased pressure which in which a condition which in which increased pressure on the eye damages the optic nerve causing vision loss 
Behind the lens is the jelly-like uh, vitreous humor. This is the illustrated here in the lower portion of the eyeball. <clears throat> okay, so the aqueous humor is in is up here in between the the iris and the, this is the pupil, the opening of the eye. Uh, this is the dark part of the eye, and then this the, there's the iris. You're all familiar with the iris. This is the colored part of the eye. It's uh, blue or green or brown. Um, and uh, here is the lens inside the structure of the eye. Uh, the lens can be uh, manipulated by uh, muscular by uh, muscular functions. So when your eye is focusing in different um, uh, different focal planes, uh, the muscles uh, adjust the the shape of the lens. And then inside the eye is the vitreous humor. And here is the fovea. Uh, this is an, a, an area we're going to get into uh, in greater detail. So there's the choroid and the sclera, which covers the entire eyeball here. And then uh, the optic nerve, which delivers the, the in nerve impulses to the brain. Okay, here is the uh, retina in greater uh, detail. Okay, here is uh, um, the retina is this uh, yellow area. Um, on the uh, inside of the the um, eyeball, okay. So it's here is uh, identified as the yellow area here. This is where your rods and cones and your sensory ap apparatus is located. Okay, the retina uh, light comes in from uh, coming from the left in the uh, in this view, uh, strikes the retina, passing through largely transparent layers of neurons before reaching the rods and cones, two types of photoreceptors that differ in shape and function. The neurons of the retina then relay visual information captured by the photoreceptors and the optic nerve and brain along the pathways shown in red arrows. Each bipolar cell receives enough in, in information from several rods or cones, and each ganglion cell gathers input from the several bipolar cells. Horizontal and amacrine cells integrate information across the retina. Once the, in, once the region of the retina, the optic disc lacks photo, one region of the uh, optic disc lacks photoreceptors. As a result, this region is called the blind spot, where light is not detected. Okay, I believe that is the fovea. Okay, here uh, we're looking at uh, photoreceptor cells and visual pigment, pigments. So this is inside the retina. This is where you have your different photoreceptor cells. Uh, humans have two main types of photoreceptor cells, rods and cones. And within the outer segment of a rod or cone is a stack of membranous discs, which... Uh, visual pigments are in, embedded. So the visual pigments are embedded in these discs here. Um, rods are more sensitive to light and, but do not distinguish colors. They enable us to see at night but only in black and white. Cones provide color vision but, le but being less sensitive contribute very little at night to night vision. There are three types of cones. Well, excuse me. There are three types of cones. Each has a different sensitivity across visible spectrum, providing an optimal response to red, green, or blue light. In the colorized scanning electron microgroth, micrograph here, uh, cones are in green and rods are in uh, light tan. The the adjust the adjustment the adjacent neurons are in purple are visible. The pigmented epithelium which is the which removed which was removed in this preparation would be to the right. Okay, so this is where um, Okay, visual pigments um, this is inside the inside those uh, discs inside the the uh, cone or the rod, in this case it's in the rod. Uh, these uh, vertebrate visual pigments consist 
of a light absorbing molecule called retinol derived from vitamin A to bound to a membrane protein called opsin. Seven alpha helicase of uh, each opsin molecule span the d disc membrane. The visual pigment of rods shown here is called rhodopsin. Uh, retinol exists in two isomers. Absorption of light shifts one bond in retinol from cis to a trans arrangement, converting the molecule from, a, uh, from an angled shape to a straight shape. This configuration destabilizes and activates the opsin protein which, to which the retinol is bound. So basically what's happening is uh, they exist the um, exist in the uh, normal state here. The uh, retinol exists in the normal state and then light causes it to shift into um, its uh, trans, uh, trans isomer phase and then um, an enzyme will shift it back into its uh, normal cis isomer phase. And the, the change in this uh, protein will, uh, will, will cause the, um, uh, uh, the corresponding red, uh, uh, red, yellow, or, or uh, well, I'm sorry, what, what color are they? Red, yellow, or green, um, red, green, or blue, um, responding uh, neuron to fire. Okay, sensory transduction in the eye. Uh, transduction of visual information to the nervous system begins when light induces the con conversion of cis retinol to trans retinol. Transretinol activates rhodopsin, which activates the G protein, eventually leading to the hydrolysis of cyclic GMP. When cyclic GMP breaks down, sodium channels close, and this hyperpolarizes the cell. The signal transduction pathway usually shuts off again as an enzyme converts retinol back to the cis form. Okay, here is uh, in rods and cones, the receptor potential triggered by light is hyperpolarization, not depolarization. So in step one here, uh, light converts cis retinol to trans retinol, activating rhodopsin. Active rhodopsin in turn uh, uh, activates, a G, oh, activates a G protein called transducin. Okay, this causes transducin. Uh, transducin activates the enzyme phosphodiesterase, and then uh, activated phosphodiesterase um, detaches a cyclic GMP from a, a sodium channels and the enzyme uh, hydrolyzing cyclic GMP to GMP. So the uh, then at the at the end of the phase here, so this allows sodium into the uh, into the neuron, and then at the end uh, the sodium channel closed when cyclic GMP detaches and the the membranes mem permeability and sodium to sodium decreases the and the rod hyperpolarizes. Okay, that's very interesting information. Uh, don't worry about it too much. The processing of visual information begins in the retina. The, in the dark, rods and cones release the neurotransmitter glutamate into synapses with neurons called bipolar cells. The bipolar cells are either hyperpolarized or depolarized in response to glutamate. In the light, rods and cones hyperpolarize shutting off release of glutamate. The bipolar cells are then either depolarized or hyperpolarized. Signals from the rods and cones can follow several pathways in the retina. A single ganglion cell receives information from an array of rods and cones, each of which responds to light coming from a particular location. 
the rods and cones that feed information to one ganglion cell define a receptive field, the part of this visual field to which the ganglion cell can respond. A smaller receptive field typically results in a sharper image. The optic nerves meet at the optic chiasm near the cerebral cortex. Sensations from the left visual field of both eyes are transmitted to the right side of the brain. Sensations from the right visual field are transmitted to the left side of the brain. It is estimated that 30% of the cerebral cortex takes part in formulating what we actually see. Among vertebrates, most fish, amphibians, and reptiles, including birds, have very good color vision. Humans and other primates are among the minority of mammals with the ability to see well. Mammals are primarily nocturnal and usually have high proportion of rods in the retina. In humans, perception of color is based on three types of cones, each with a different visual pigment. Red green or blue. E these pigments are called photopsins and are, are formed when the retinol binds to three distinct opsin proteins. Abnormal color vision results from al alterations in the genes for one or more photopsin proteins. The, green, the genes for the red and green uh, pigments are located in the X chromosomes. A mutation in one copy of, e of either gene can disrupt color vision in males. That's why red-green color blindness is typically found in males. Uh, the, vi the brain processes visual information and controls what information is captured. Focusing occurs by changing the shape of the lens. The fovea is the center of the field that, obtains, that contains no rods but a high density of cones. Okay, so uh, now this is an exercise um, on page 774, the scientific skills exercise, uh, designing a, an experiment using genetic mutants. Uh, basically, what they wanted to know is if the um, uh, supra, supra chiasmatic nucleus was responsible for um, the was responsible for the um, uh, diurnal uh, circadian period. So they had two different uh, hamsters. One hamster had a 24-hour circadian period, uh, or uh, two different groups of hamsters. One group of hamsters had uh, 24 circadian, 24-hour circadian rhythm, and the second group had a 20-hour uh, circadian rhythm. And they took the um, they took the super chiasmatic uh, nucleus uh, from uh, from each one of them and switched them. And then they found by switching them, they switched the, the uh, 20 hour ones into the bodies, the brains and bodies of the uh, wild type hamsters. And then that caused them to have 20 hour uh, circadian rhythms. And they took the, uh, the um, super chiasmatic nucleus of the uh, of the 24-hour hamsters and put them in the uh, mutant hamsters, and then they got the anyway. It, 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 it's an it's a it's a thought experiment that you can do if you want to. Um, it just shows you what uh, uh, when you take a part of the brain of a hamster and put it into a different hamster and determine what the uh, uh, circadian rhythm is. Okay, here is a little review um, on uh, page 790 in your concept review. Uh, the vertebrate brain is regionally specialized. So you talk, talk about all these uh, different parts of the brain and what their functions are.